Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am talking with uh, two guests. They're co-authors of the book, Every Brain Needs Music, The Neuroscience of Making and Listening to Music. I am talking with Larry Sherman and Dennis Plies. Larry is a neuroscientist and musician. Um, he is the professor of neuroscience at the Oregon Health and Science University. Dennis has uh, been a music professor for many, many years um, at Warner Pacific University and has really, as he states in the conversation, been involved with music his entire life um, and has played uh, marimba and has recorded many albums in different genres, including gospel, classical, and jazz. So it's really cool, neuroscientists and a professional musician getting together, writing a book about music. And music is also a big love of mine as well. And so um, it really was a wonderful conversation. We talk about how they came to write the book together and what that process was like. We try to define what music is. Uh, we talk about the different parts of the brain. Um, and we talk about different elements of music and then how they're connected. We talk about the idea of musical preferences and how they're different. We talk about the differences between composing and improvising. We discuss the role of curiosity, memory and music, truth and art, and many other topics. Um, I had so much fun uh, with, with this conversation. Again, I, I love music. Um, I have a little bit of a background in neuropsych, and so really kind of a merging of my world as well. The book's fantastic. It's very readable. and um, they they also have a really nice uh, way of of interacting with each other, and the three of us got along very well, and and I really just had a blast. Uh, you can find this conversation and all other conversations at Converging Dialogues at Substack dot com. I'm also on YouTube, uh, so subscribe, follow, and uh, share widely. And now I bring you Larry Sherman and Dennis Plies. I am here with Larry Sherman and Dennis Plies. Uh, gentlemen, thank you both for coming on the podcast. I'm looking forward to talking to both of you. Thanks for having us. Great. It's wonderful. Of course. Of course. Uh, you guys have uh, written a, a wonderful book uh, called Every Brain Needs Music. Um, and we'll get into all of that. Um, before we do, uh, each of you just kind of give me your kind of... Uh, snapshot uh, biography of your yourselves, I guess, professionally. So what, what you uh, what you do, what you study, what your background's in, and what you're currently up to. So uh, sure, I, I'll start. I'm, I'm Larry Sherman. I'm a professor of neuroscience at the Oregon Health and Science University. Uh, my day job is spent trying to figure out how to fix damaged brains and people with diseases like multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but I'm also the president of the Society for Neuroscience for uh, uh, Portland, Oregon, and uh, Oregon in general, and Southwest Washington. And uh, as such, I give public talks on a number of topics, including music and the brain. Uh, I've been playing music my entire life um, and been fascinated by the subject. So that's where I'm coming from. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, Dennis? Yes. Uh, I was born in 1942 and... <laughs> took a strong liking to hearing music, uh, particularly piano, classical piano music at the age of three, <laughs> sit still for uh, an hour listening and begged for lessons in a non, otherwise non-musical family. And one thing led to another. I, I, I uh, play marimba and vibes, uh, marimba and classically and vibes in a jazz context. And that's another part of my story is at age 28, I was confronted in Chicago by my professor in as we're studying percussion. Do you want to talk about improvisation or do you want to do it? And I made a big leap having been 28 years only reading music, but always dinking around. But uh, improv has taken me into a doctoral uh, of how to teach improvisation mm -hmm. and and help others who want to be liberated in different ways because mm -hmm. <laughs> re reading is great but there's this other thing in the brain <laughs> yeah, that's, that's 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 wonderful i i guess the 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 next question here is is kind of always the the, the natural question for people is uh, is twofold i guess is how did you guys uh, come to write the book together? I, I think you mentioned in the book, but how did you come to write this book together? 
And um, one thing I'm always curious about is, is who kind of does what? Do you you do this chapter, I'll do this chapter, or you do that section, I'll do this section, or uh, was it just both of you guys kind of working in a Google Doc somewhere at the same time? How, how, did, you, <laughs> how did you guys come to write the book, and how did you kind of write it together? Well, it, it's kind of a funny story. Yeah, so um, I've been giving these talks about music and the brain and playing piano on stage for many, many years. In fact, I, I think I've probably given it over 300 times and about six different countries now. And uh, I uh, regularly play racquetball at a local gym here with friends very early in the morning. And uh, I had just given one of those talks the night before here in Portland and uh, was talking to my racquetball partner about it. He was asking me how it went. And uh, this gentleman who I'd seen at the gym off and on um, kind of chimes in and said, did you say you just gave a talk about music and the brain? And I said, yeah. And he says, I've been to your talk. In fact, I've been to it more than once. And uh, I just didn't recognize you because you didn't have any clothes on. So, so, so we started talking, and um, Dennis and I became uh, close friends. I think, uh, to the annoyance of my racquetball partners, we'd spend many, uh, many extra minutes in the gym talking about everything under the sun regarding music and philosophy and everything else. Mm. Um, and I got more and more ideas about, you know, the importance of this subject and and how to present it. And uh, finally, asked Dennis. Um, hey, you know, I, everyone says I should write a book about this talk I give, but maybe we should write one together from the standpoint of the neuroscience, but also from the standpoint of someone who is a professional musician and also a professional teacher of music. And uh, Dennis actually said yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Quite excitedly. <laughs> yeah. The it's great. Yeah. So, so, so either, either of you can answer this. So how did you guys actually do it? How did you guys, you know, everyone has a different kind of thing, but how did you actually write the, the book together? I think a lot of it was that I would write about what it takes to practice and to teach music and to perform music. And then Larry lays, lays the neuroscience on top of those scenarios. Mm. Is that fair enough? Larry? Yeah, I think I think that's probably right. I mean, and, and each chapter was kind of different in that respect. Um, we also talked for a long time about the fact that we felt like we needed other voices. Mm. And uh, Dennis and I both came up with a, a survey that we sent out to around 100 people. And the, the responses from that survey were were amazing. The questions were based on sort of our general thinking about an outline for the book and the topics we wanted to cover. Mm -hmm. um, but we got some fantastic quotes from professional musicians. We actually, it's funny, we, I remember um, we had talked about wanting to send this to famous musicians mm. initially. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we both talked about it. It was like, those aren't really the people who are going to give you the insights about what's the, the current struggle, you know? Um, <laughs> and so we, we really wanted to kind of expand our respondents to just beyond, mm. you know, talking to the most famous people we found. And we did find a few famous people, including ones we knew, but... Um, and they did provide some of the uh, interesting, most interesting quotes. But um, we got real insight, I think, from these respondents to these questions, uh, and it really drove how we uh, framed each chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's, it's it's super it's super wonderful how you guys you know kind of lay out the the book, and there's a kind of seamlessness to it. Um, so let's talk about uh, music first. So I mean, for myself, I'm a I'm a big music fan. I was you know. Uh, classically trained by a wonderful uh, Ukrainian uh, piano teacher for about eight years. Um, and uh, it was great. Uh, school of hard knocks in some ways. <laughs> she, was, she was tough and she was, she was wonderful. Um, and, um, you know, and I got busy and did other things, obviously, but uh, I have a big love for music. I come from a, at least one side of my family is, uh, is pretty musical themselves. And so uh, reading, reading the book was, was great. Um, I have a, concentration in neuropsychology so it was kind of a marrying of two worlds for me as well reading the book which was cool um so i, I guess the question i want to start with is sort of definitional kinds of things is um how do you guys usually define what music is so what makes something music as opposed to say noise or something else um and how essential is the the human brain for creating music um uh I have a friend who teaches at a conservatory, and the dean of that conservatory uh, retired, came back five years later, and posed a question to the faculty. 
with a bunch of doctorates. Uh, why music? What? What? Why do we do this? And uh, they were speechless. I uh, I realized it's simple one word vibration, <laughs> and humans have decided to organize these vibrations into sound and silence. That's one of my favorite uh, clarifications of what music is. Um, it's organized sound and silence. Uh, it's all based on the brain <laughs> interpreting and perceiving and, and uh, re responding in a variety of ways. Yeah. And I, I think that was one of the things we, we actually tried to grapple in, in our, our early chapters. Um, you know, what is music and, and, and why, and why is music? <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't, it's, it's, a, it's one of those questions that's more philosophy than science, to be honest. I mean, yeah. it, it is like all sound variations and vibrations of air molecules um, and how they, they float to the air. And, but it's also what happens when those uh, air molecules hit our, hit our ears and rattle our tympanic membranes and um, activate all the neurons in different parts of the brain. And, mm -hmm what we call music as human beings is such a distinct set of patterns of, of sounds compared to um, what other animals on our own planet um, uh, perceive as sounds. And, and, and quote, I, don't, I don't know if you would call it, call it music. We call bird songs songs, but uh, mm -hmm. to call them songs might be a bit of a stretch compared to what we call music. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in fact, when you look at the brain of a bird, it's doing something very different when it responds to those sounds mm -hmm. than what our brains are doing. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the definition of music has to include the physics uh, of these these vibrating air molecules, but also the neuroscience of what the brain does when it, it hits that particular combination of, of silence and vibration and noise um, mm. that can be music of any kind. Mm. So, so let me ask here, let's, let's just do a kind of overview here. Um, maybe, Larry, you might take this one and I'll come to you, Dennis, on, on the next one is kind of just to, you can go the overview of the brain for just as a kind of quick, you know, two minute primer on this, you know, the four major lobes, cerebellum, neurons, you know, postsynaptic, presynaptic activities. Um, and then what are the, I guess, the kind of um, highlighted areas, I guess, that where, where music works in the brain. I can already feel your answer. Well, the music is everywhere in the brain, <laughs> but maybe there are some uh, ways in which the, you know, the brain is, is preoccupied with music, um, you know, in certain areas as opposed to others and what that could mean, but it just kind of give us the overview. So, so folks kind of have the kind of, um, language of sorts of, of, uh, of what's going on for the brain. Sure. So, um, as you mentioned that there are lobes in the brain, um, and each have their own sets of functions. There's not one particular function to each lobe and they all interact with each other. Um, so they all depend on each other functionally. Um, our, there's our frontal lobes, which most people know is where our so-called executive functions lie. Um, all things about judgment and everything else, but also movement is there. Um, there's the parietal lobe, which is really mostly involved with sensory uh, aspects of what, what our, our world is about, sensing temperature, sensing uh, touch and everything else that's happening around us. Um, there's the temporal lobe which has a huge function with learning and memory and, and other aspects of cognition. But um, also, it's the location of the, our auditory cortex, which, of course, is very important for hearing music. And then there's our occipital lobe, which is primarily involved with vision, but has other functions as well. You mentioned the cerebellum, uh, it, which has classically been described as the, the part of our brain that coordinates our movements. But interestingly, it's also really important in music processing, as it turns out, and mm -hmm. detecting things like rhythm. Uh, so there's so there's all these different parts of the brain, and if you think about how the brain engages with music, you're right. I mean, pretty much the entire brain is involved. When we think about just listening to music, or taking in these air molecules into our ears, the information is being processed from the ear to that auditory cortex I mentioned. Uh, that auditory cortex is that's fascinating. Uh, there's uh, one study that suggested. We may actually have neurons that are more responsive to uh, music than they are to other types of sounds. Um, and to me, that's fascinating. And mm -hmm. it's a chicken and egg question. Is the human brain, are these neurons there to be more responsive to the things that are like music? Mm -hmm. Or do they become neurons that are music specific as we become exposed to music? 
big open question. Mm. But the fact that they're there is to me amazing. Mm. Um, and those cells then project to other areas of auditory cortex that distinguish other aspects of the sound, which then project to yet other parts of the brain to uh, get to the memory of the sound, what it means, the emotional content of those sounds, all these other aspects. But that's just listening to music. Mm -hmm. Now, if you turn that on its head and ask about what you're doing when you're, for example, learning to perform an play an instrument or when you're performing an instrument, you think about what your brain is doing. I, I would argue it's the most difficult challenge in the world to play a musical instrument for a human brain. So you're, uh, let's say you're reading music. Um, so you're, you're taking this information off the, the musical page or off of a, a phone <laughs> or, or somebody's tablet. Mm -hmm. It's going into your eyes, going to the back of your eyes where your retina is. Those, neuro those are neurons. Uh, they're taking in that light signal, sending it to the back of your brain. That's being processed and interpreted as notes, which then are being sent to other parts of your brain to instruct you on what those notes mean, and then what you need to do with your right hand and your middle finger, uh, which in includes information like where to put your finger, how much pressure to put your finger on, whatever it is you're touching, all these other things. And then there's feedback from that. It's coming back to uh, give you information about telling your brain where your finger is now, that it's made that move correctly. Uh, you're hearing things around you, so other musicians perhaps, or your audience is booing you or, or cheering you on. That will alter how you perform because uh, your auditory inf information can then go right to your motor cortex and say, do something different. Mm. Um, you're having an emotional response to what you're hearing. Uh, so you're, you're really challenging every aspect of your nervous system when you're either listening to or performing or, or practicing music. And, and it's a remarkable how much plasticity there is mm. that can be induced by that. I mean, it's, it's in incredible. And, and it really challenges our, a lot of our older concepts about... Um, what the brain is in an adult, in adult humans, mm. um, and what it can do, and yeah. how it can change. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's that's a that's a wonderful overview. I'll just say real quick on that is I always think of uh, drummers, uh, and specifically drummers that also sing. Um, you're you're literally using uh, five things at once uh, potentially. So I, I I can never understand uh, drummers that sing. I guess you know so someone that uh, people will know is popular is Phil Collins. Um, I, I, that blows my mind for me where you're using both feet, both hands, and you're singing <laughs> at the same time and you're playing with other people and you have to keep all of the things with music. I, that, that's, I mean, those people are superhumans to me. I, I think about organists who do the same thing, right? Uh, yes, 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 so yes. You, I mean, you're using both feet to do different things with those feet, mm -hmm. both hands to do different things at different levels, even mm -hmm. uh, pulling up stops every now and then. And maybe you're, and if you're singing along, oh my gosh, you know, that's, that's yeah. just nuts. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. So, so, so Dennis, I get you here on, on, on the different types or different components of music. Something that's uh, in the book is you, you guys talk about uh, rhythm, pitch, tempo, contour, timbre, loudness, reverberation. Um, just tell us all of the, the, the things, or I guess the ingredients or the pieces of, I would take it from the listener's perspective of what we're hearing, you know, kind of when we hear music, what are these components of what we're, we're hearing? Well, uh, first I am a definite believer that the, the brain is automatically looking for patterns, whether they're visual patterns or aural patterns, it, we're pattern perceivers and that sets up expectations and and now I'll talk about these different uh, areas like rhythm the the fact that we hear um something that causes us to tap our foot regularly that that's a pattern and uh and then when, when i teach rhythm it's about okay there's per beat but maybe a, a sound is longer than a beat the you know long and then it's there's division of the beat uh in halves in thirds and in fourths and and then most of the other things are uh multiplications of those but twos threes and fours in the division uh in terms of pitch it uh we typically perceive this is higher than this is lower <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, when it's sung sung that's even more clear and uh tempo it is that the rate of speed 
So like you can even think of it in, in walking, uh, what's a person's gait and, uh, walking with somebody, wow, they're going fast and they're, oh, they're going slow. Uh, that's tempo and contour. I think about the contour of da 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 really minimal and conservative and simple and beautiful. <laughs> it's going to last forever. But many contours are uh, much more uh, dramatic and uh, timbre. Sometimes it, it's pronounced timber or timbre, and uh, both are acceptable. But it, that for me is one of the most important elements of music is the tone quality so if i hear a human voice singing if i hear a, a bass clarinet playing a violin playing I, i'm first on on it tone quality the timbre mm -hmm. the, the, that is like you, you can often tell the first two notes of uh uh, Joshua Redman or somebody that of oh that that's that person just mm -hmm. by the tone quality the timbre mm -hmm. and loudness is is pretty obvious that I'm talking softer right now <laughs> and now I'm talking louder mm -hmm. and reverberation I think it has a lot to do with acoustics and uh, the the shapes and materials in in a in a room or a a house uh, or even outside. Uh, what what can it the sound waves bounce off of and how do they do that so a recording studio has built in all kinds of shapes on purpose mm -hmm. to de de diffract and um well, those those are some of the elements in music and they're actually elements of life <laughs> <laughs> and, and they all come back to the same things we were talking about before right i mean we're still talking about vibrations Mm -hmm. uh these air molecules and these vibrations in the air and um and those are affected by all sorts of things the source of the instrument or the music or the voice um the shape of the space that that voice is being released into um where the perceiver is relative to all of that mm -hmm. um and that's all the physics aspects of it and then that's all put into our ears and immediately becomes the neuroscience mm -hmm. so yeah, you 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 explain it well, Dennis. And I want to I want to jump on something you were talking about earlier, uh, Larry. It seems like a good time to to bring this up. Uh, we'll get to uh, composing and, and practicing music, but I want to ask about listening <clears throat> to music. This is something that I've talked with uh, people uh, that I know, you know, friends, family, whatever. And and I've realized, I mean, obviously there's individual differences with people and things like that, but people listen to music differently, and they're listening. Uh, for different things and i think then this has some type of um w subjective uh preferences here so as an example one of the things on the first page of the book in your guys in your guys book you mentioned one of my favorite bands is king crimson right mm -hmm. i love yeah. king crimson right uh i i saw them for their 50th a couple years ago um and it was the best show I've ever been to, and and I've been to a lot of <laughs> a lot of uh, concerts and and shows and things like that, and and it was incredible. It was it was incredible for so many different reasons. But I've found that a lot of people don't like King Crimson um, because it's too busy, it's too noisy. Uh, it's some people have said it's a kind of musicians band or it's a it's a thinking person's band. I don't want to think <laughs> about all these things or it's too odd or it's you know and that's all the reasons i love it i, I find all of those things uh, deeply fascinating so i guess my general question here is is how do we i guess listen to music um and and how does this different another way of saying this is you know some people might really gravitate towards folks that use you know minor chords versus or keys versus major keys so I'm more prone to like Beethoven and Rachmaninoff than I will Haydn or Mozart, just you know because they're typically in you know minor or major keys or things of this nature. And obviously, there's an emotional component. But how, how do we listen to music, and why? You know, obviously, there's differences. But what are people listening to, or, or do they think about what they're listening to when we're listening to music? Well, I think you you've kind of hit the nail on the head in the first aspect of your question, and that's you know 
we all listen to music probably in different contexts. And even the one person can listen to music in dozens of ways. Um, you can be uh, in a store uh, and there's Muzak playing or or just some or, or soundtrack playing, but you're you're not intentionally listening, right? Uh, and I and Dennis and I have talked about this a lot. I mean, there's intentional listening where you're really there to take it in. Uh, and then there's the background music of life, um, which unfortunately invades our space sometimes when we don't want it to. Um, there's also intentionally listening, but keeping it in the background. So most people, um, when they're driving, are hopefully paying attention to the road, but they often do have music on. And it's it's interesting because there's a fine line between uh, music that grabs your attention away from other things that you're doing. I've had that conversation with my children millions of times when they were doing their homework. Um, uh, as opposed to music that's just there to kind of be in the background and keep you awake. And in fact, that's an interesting point too, because um, there's music has a great way of actually ex, uh, enhancing your attention, making you, that's arousal, right? It's mm -hmm. about more attention. Mm -hmm. um, but it can take you so much away from the thing that you're trying to do that you stop being effective at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you put on something that I want to stand up and sing and dance to, I'm not going to get a lot of work done. Um, if you put on some beautiful jazz in the background that doesn't have lyrics mm -hmm. or even classical music, um, that I'm not like so emotionally tied to, it's going to keep me more aroused, more awake. Um, but it's not going to grab my attention away from me. So I think there's so many different ways we listen to music in our daily lives. Um, and I think what that reason is that you're listening to at the moment will depend a lot on, uh, what happens next. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think you you hit on another thing, which is music preference. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, this is a fascinating area to me because there's some studies that suggest that we actually develop our preferences for music pretty early in life. We have sort of lifelong loves of certain types of music. And that's developed based on what we're exposed to. Mm -hmm. um, there's peer influences there. I mean, I know uh, a lot of girlfriends influenced by my, my musical taste over the years. Um, <laughs> Uh, as well as friends who I grew up with as a teenager. Mm. And then as I got older, I, I don't know about you, Dennis, but as I got older, I I, I found that um, I really challenged myself in different ways to listen to different kinds of music and mm -hmm. uh, came to like it. I, I was forced to uh, really get into Bartok um, <laughs> several years ago by a local pianist who invited me to give a talk about rhythm in Bartok. Mm. Um, and... Uh, I just, I never liked Bartok before that. And then I started listening to it. And then I realized there's something really interesting going on here. When you start to learn about the intention of the compose, composer mm. and how the musicians are carrying that intention forward, I think that can really influence your preference and, and your likes of music and why I like it. What do you think, Dennis? My, uh, my response initially is very subjective. It's like food and music <laughs> so if you go down the cafeteria and you see what the person in front and behind you are taking and what you're taking mm -hmm. it's just one person loves beets and the next person no way uh, mm -hmm. they love cauliflower uh, whatever it is I, and i i simply think that par part of that is exposure and and knowledge and intentionality in some cases, <laughs> where you choose to eat something that you don't like, but uh, I also think the peer peer part, uh, and I also think that at stages of our life, um, in my twenties, I listened to hardcore avant-garde music, and <laughs> I, I don't really have much time for it now. I, um, and and as I age, I find that I almost am shutting off to a lot of jazz that i used to just excite me no end now i need the classical music more organized uh modified modified music so i think there's a lot of factors in, in this um and but i do believe i went to a, a person's 70th birthday party and and he had all of us about 12 of us fill out on a three by five card our favorite top 10 musical groups and and it always came back after we shared all of ours it was what was happening between the ages of 10 and 30 yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they call this there's a name for this it's something about uh, the thing is not maybe the ages but there's a 
we remember things between 10 and 30. It's a thing that's called this reminiscence bump or whatever it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's these, true. These formative years, uh, adolescence, young adulthood, you know, that's your time or whatever um, is, is is the things that kind of stick the most, which is uh, which is interesting. But according to what both you guys are saying, it's the same for me as I have like my kind of core types of uh, uh, groups or music, but man, even in the past five years, but 10 years, I mean, have just completely, you know, burst open. And I, I listen to stuff I never would have listened to. Mm. Uh, I, I've said this story before, but I, this is a fun example I give sometimes is for a long time, um, people of all ages would, would, would talk about the Beatles. The Beatles this, the Beatles that. Oh my God, they're geniuses. Oh, they're amazing. That's you know, you know, peak music. Whatever people would say about you know the Beatles. I never liked the Beatles, and and it's not necessarily a generation or age thing. Of course, there's specifics to that, but I just didn't get it. And if I didn't get it, I was just kind of like, that's fine. I don't hate it, but I just don't get like you know everyone's like you know, and even people younger than me were like, oh, I have every album of theirs on vinyl. They're amazing. You know, whatever. And finally, I, I I talked to a few people and I and I, I just kind of like cornered them, and I said, okay, you got to explain to me why why am I supposed to like the Beatles? Like, what am I missing? Like, how I'm a I'm a you know average you know musical person. I mean, I can I learned how to read music at one point. I understand music, and, and what am I missing? And so they sat down, and they explained to me uh, culturally, yes. But also what they're doing in terms of songwriting, McCartney and Lennon, what they would do in terms of of how to 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 organize a song, and and then doing that over and over and over and over for ten years, and basically making all hits, and then progressing to different genres of music, but finding a lot of the simplicity of things that people like and hear, but something that's deeply musical in a way that's really, really thoughtful. And then the ability to keep doing that album after album for a full decade. And then I, I started listening to it. And then I, and then I, I just, it kind of all clicked for me one day. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Like I get, that's not, it is not easy. Cause then I put myself in the position of like, I, I can't, I can't make a chorus like that. Like a, I, I, that's, how do you find where does that come from to make these these melodies or these choruses that are so like capturing and they're all a little different but it's in the same kind of world and i i i, I find that you know uh, pretty brilliant and it's like yeah. okay it's like wow how you know, how did i miss that for so long right and then the the the, the peter jackson uh documentary that came out oh, a get year, back yeah a year or two ago whenever it was i mean just took me to the other level i just was like i get it i get it now i'm okay i get it you know i still don't listen watching them them create music that way literally music was it blew my mind it blew my mind i mean i totally agree um, so it's funny you say that about the beatles because yeah and what you were saying earlier about king crimson because when i first heard king King, King crimson i was like "Ah." (laughs) but when i was 16 a friend of mine was a huge king crimson fan and he said no 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 you larry you play music listen to this and uh, it was funny because I was a huge fan of Emerson, Lincoln, pa- Lake and Palmer. Oh, yeah. Right. And great. he said, I want you to listen to this as though you're listening to an ELP album. Mm-hmm. And I, mm-hmm. I kind of got what he was saying. Mm-hmm. And then I listened to it. And I thought, oh, yeah. And then you start to really appreciate the musicality of it. And then you sort of get into the rhythms and everything else that they were doing. And yeah, it's great. It's what, great. I love what it. Was, what was the first uh, King Crimson you like really sat down and listened to it at that it point? It was their second album. Um, the islands or lizard yeah or yeah 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 one of those yeah yeah, yeah. it was that's it great. was i just loved it yeah. so and, and then i ran down to tower records which is what you did back in the day that's that's right <laughs> and uh bought all the other ones and I listened to them as well so yeah well it sounds like context and intentionality and influence of of friends mm-hmm. are playing into a lot of music listening absolutely yeah, I mean for sure. I mean, I mean, are, are you also a King Crimson fan, or 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 no? You 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 don't care. Not aware. Of, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he knows the quotes. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, well, I do want to ask you then. So we can talk about composing and and uh, and uh, and improvising. So in the book somewhere, is talking about this composing is thinking and sound, which I thought was a really cool way of explaining that. What what uh, 
how how is it thinking and sound, and uh, what is the kind of differences between composing and, and improvising? I uh, was on jet lag when I was in Beijing in 2005 and waking up at two in the morning and there was no piano around. Uh, I, I felt like writing a jazz tune, which became a, a tune on an album with a friend. Uh, I wrote it out of my head. It wasn't didn't take long. Uh, it was quiet in the house and uh that's thinking and sound. I composed. I was, I heard the music in my head, and I I know how to write it down. And I I could hear the rhythm. I could hear the harmony, and all that just got onto paper. Now, when I'm improvising, truly improvising, I'm not thinking. That's uh, that, that's a a, a knockout killer phrase to have to think of to not think about <laughs> is to that improvisation in its uh most pure form is when you're not thinking mm. you're letting go but the structure behind all of that all the preparation is a, a lot of thinking mm. you learn phrases you learn patterns you learn tunes, you, you do this and that, to, to, you have your scale and a chord background, lots of structural, but then you let go of it when it's time to just improvise and you accept what you do without judgment. <laughs> so mm. it's a great parallel to meditation. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask about that is, is, uh, so I have a handful of friends that like make music. They're in bands and stuff. And, and I have a really good friend of mine. Uh, we've been friends since we were kids. And he, um, he's he's been one of these these guys that's just kind of like a prodigy. You know, he's his you know third arm is a guitar neck. I mean, he's just been playing music since he was like 10, 11 years old. And you know, he's you know now in his you know you know mid thirties or whatever. And he's just I mean prolific. I mean, he writes amazing things. I mean. He, he listens to everything. He loves classical. He's, you know, and he, he has, you know, obviously some, some training in it, of course. And he's just, but he's just, just naturally gifted. I, I feel. And, um, one time, you know, he writes, I mean, you know, the most amazing stuff and really, really, you know, a lot of like, you know, technical ability and, and just some really, really cool, cool stuff. You know, a lot of, uh, dissonant things or different types of chords or different types of song structures, et cetera. Right. So very, very outside the box. And, um, sometimes I, I've, we've talked about this and sometimes he'll say, I'll say, this was great. How did you do this? Like, how did you come up with that, that rhythm? It's so off, you know, it, it, it might be, you know, syncopated or it might be a polyrhythm or whatever, but it, or sometimes not. It's just, and he'll say, you know, so this doesn't happen every time, but sometimes he'll say, I heard it in my head. Right. I heard, I heard it and I have my shorthand or sometimes, you know, maybe notation or whatever. And then I had to like learn how to play it because I couldn't play it. And mm. it was, it's, the most, it's one of the most frustrating things is like, I hear it. And, you know, sometimes you, there's another friend that would be, you know, maybe, you know, could perform it a little bit better than he could. And say, okay, yeah, play it like this and just kind of like hum it out or whatever. Okay. This here, you know, here and here. And then the other, you know, friend can just like, oh, like this and then play it. Like, yeah, exactly. That's how it is. And sometimes it's interesting how we can hear things in our head and we know exactly how it sounds or how it's the song arrangement is or the composition. But then the performing it is completely different. And sometimes people, you know, will say, you know, I can think of plenty of bands that said, yeah, I wrote this drum part for the song and it took me six months to learn how to play it. Like I, I made it up, but I had to learn how to play my own thing because it was just mm. beyond the mm. level of it. And I find that deeply fascinating about how we can hear things, but we can't necessarily do it or, or perform it. Have you ever, either one of you had examples of that where you've written something or have an idea and it's just like, I don't know if I can actually play this. It's, it's you know, it, too hard. It's something we, I didn't get, we didn't get into writing this to uh, this part of the book together. Uh, we talked about it a lot, but we never really put it in because there's just not a really good set of science out there. Mm. What you're describing is exactly what people who play by ear do as well. Mm. The difference is they're not coming up with the idea for the music. 
they're hearing it somewhere else. Mm. So someone who can play by ear can hear something and then they can sit down and teach themselves to play it. And most people who play by ear have to kind of sort it out. They don't just sit down automatically and play it, but mm -hmm. they'll sort it out. But they don't have any written music. They don't have anything in front of them to instruct them. They've just heard it. They've got a good oral memory mm -hmm. uh, for what they've heard. And then they can sort of work it out on the piano or the guitar or the violin or or whatever, right? Um, if you Interestingly, when we sing things, we can sing it right away. We don't have to work it out. So if I if I have a, a little melody in my head, and uh, you know, there's these old stories about Beethoven when he when he was writing the ninth, he had the the Ode to Joy just stuck in his head, and he was apparently his housekeeper complained that he was just driving her nuts, running around the house, whistling or humming this this inane tune that she was driving her nuts. Now the most one of the most famous phrases in music in the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but he could do that right away. But of course, he needed to just now put that down. To pen and paper mm -hmm. and then write a symphony around that right mm -hmm. um and and uh i i think those processes are probably the same mm -hmm. and and it involves as as dennis said um uh, it's not improv improvisation at that point it's it's having a, a theme an idea and then building on it in very intentional way with the intention that it will become a piece of music Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a, a long involved process that involves editing and changing and oh, yeah. everything else. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when you look at what's happening in the brain, when you're doing that, it's, it's pretty, pretty different than what's happening in during improvisation. Mm -hmm. Dennis, what about, what about on, on, on your well, side of things? I'm thinking, uh, uh, when I play by ear versus when I'm improvising, they're very related and yet um if i let if i play by ear i feel i'm i'm using the non-thinking part of my brain but it's not the same directly as um improvising because mm -hmm. improvising is upon a structure and the playing by ear is finding the structure mm -hmm. uh, and, and especially if i do it in many keys <laughs> it's one thing to know something in a certain key but it's another thing to <laughs> yeah do, do, do you find that that's just kind of instinct when it's when it's improvisation like you're it's very an unconscious kind of thing like yeah yeah the structure's in there i don't i'm not thinking about structure now but i'm going off of feeling mood this kind of instinct kind of thing is that is that is that is that right that uh, that would i that feels comfortable to say it as in, instinctual yeah not not thoughtful not mm -hmm. if i'm if i'm thinking like i've got to do this to mm -hmm. prove that that then i'm i'm, I'm back to a pro, uh, composition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like we always talk about it and we, we mentioned that in that chapter in the book um it's based though on a lot of experience mm -hmm. that allowed yeah. you to go off and do that right mm -hmm. and as dennis mentioned before i mean it's you've got some structure in your mind i'm going to riff on key of f minor you know uh in this particular scale system of sorts mm -hmm. um so you do have rules that you're playing by but you can get very experimental and get really out there around those rules and break those rules a little bit um i always joke when i uh give my talks i uh, uh about rules and expectations there's parts of the brain that light up when we're uh hearing music about that are involved rules and expectations and so i'll play a, a c scale you know c d e f g uh, and I'll say, okay, you all ex expected that note after F to be G, but then I place C, D, E, F, F sharp, mm -hmm. and everyone kind of jolts, mm -hmm. right? Because you're breaking the rules. And I said, okay, now if I do that a few times in a row and add maybe some chords, it's not noise anymore. It's, it's or mistake. It's jazz. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how we we. I, I found this even for myself and for other people when they're writing something, you know, it's not right. It needs to have now again depends on what what kind of music you're making and all these things but you want the kind of sometimes the 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 completion of the thought the musical thought right whatever that could be it might not necessarily be like the finality so the cdfg comes next sometimes you can push against it like you're saying and you can say well what if we just you know go to you know uh, a sharp over here or a flat and then you know see what that's like and and you know play around with it but um so Along those lines, 
either one of you can take this, but uh, what's this role of curiosity um, mm-hmm. and and the role of mental imagery for for creating music? Uh, Larry, you can talk about some of the areas in the brain, a lot of right uh, hemisphere stuff, uh, and and what that looks like for for maybe jazz pianists as opposed to other other types of musicians. Yeah, I, I curiosity is really interesting, and we, we came back to that actually um, when we were writing this. Um, one of the people, who, one of the people who reviewed it from uh, Columbia uh, Columbia University Press, suggested that we explore it further. And sure enough, I mean, we it's come up in multiple chapters. But when it comes to um, composition or or even improvisation, uh, you kind of mentioned it, right? You're 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 okay. Let's play with it. I've got a C D E F. Maybe we shouldn't have G come next. Let's. What happens if an A A A, a flat comes next, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that curiosity can actually drive creativity, I think. And that's um, the example we give in the book is um, the Beethoven uh, uh, piano sonatas um, and how his curiosity about really drove him in a very ex- experimental ways. I mean, to the point of having one of his last pieces include syncopated rhythms that predated ragtime mm-hmm. by a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet there it was. So I think, I think, um, that drive for curiosity, it's, you know, there's a lot of neurochemistry in there. I mean, when you're curious and your curiosity kind of gets aroused, uh, you can drive all that dopamine signaling and, and, uh, and that makes you want to do more and explore further. And sometimes curiosity leads to a dead end, of course, and then you don't get that dopamine rush and you kind of back off. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's all, it's all connected. And I think, I think the, the, it also drives our music preference, right? So, King Crimson, Crimson's a great example, right? I I heard it once, only got a small sampling of it. Didn't want to sample more because I I didn't get it. And then someone convinced me to listen further, and my curiosity got to me. And finally, I was like, oh, I get it now. And that that drove me to like the music more. So I think it really plays a, a lot of different roles mm. when it comes to how we interact with music. What do you, What do you think, Dennis? Oh, yeah, I think curiosity. Uh, it helps us be playful experimental explore (laughs) all these elements uh that are improvisational really Mm. in spirit it's interesting i i want to ask about the the one thing you said at the end there uh so king crimson is as an example obviously it's a lot of music but there's there's something about uh it's very popular online as well there's something about the first time you hear something, right? There's plenty of reaction channels online. <laughs> You're the first time they hear, you know, whatever. Um, and it's interesting because you you can't ever get the first time. But again, but it's interesting because there's the initial reaction. You're bringing all your experiences. But also, for me personally, I actually am really comfortable if I don't like something the first time. Because usually, mm. usually it means... Oh, I have to really sit with this. I have to, I have to listen to it again and again, and then, and then it's, and then it's like this slow kind of veil is 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 kind of removed, and it's like, oh, all right, I hear this now. Oh, I didn't hear that the last time I listened to it, and it's almost like there's a kind of relationship with the piece of every time you're listening to it, you're hearing something different, and 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 what and what can that be? And I think sometimes with, you know, kind of, you know, top 40 stuff, you know, very popular music, it, it's all, it's not all of it. I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to be unfair, but a lot of that stuff can tend to be, um, you know, I think of kind of like junk food for, for the musical ear. Sometimes it's just like, I'm going to give you everything that you want. It's going to be four, four, same beat, doesn't change, you know, it's everything you're expecting. And then, you know, and some of that's fine for me personally, though, I find that I don't, if I don't really sometimes I don't really love it the first time. And I'm like, ah, this is interesting. Let me, let me see, let me listen again. And then you start, it's, oh, wow, this is super layered. There's so many things going on. Wow. Okay. And then, and then I find that those pieces of music or those albums, they age so much better and they can tend to become, you know, some of my favorites because it's, it's always like this bottomless. Well, you kind of keep going back to it and it's like, oh, Okay, I mean, and I think you know, if you want to take something older, um, yeah, I, I thought it was great what you mentioned in the in in the book about Beethoven. 
if you listen to Piano Sonata One and Piano Sonata Thirty Two, it sounds like a different person made it. I mean, and probably Absolutely. theory kind of was in some ways, but even the ones there's these kind of periods, you know, the early, middle, late Beethoven, um, where it's just like, wow, like I, I I've heard all of those so many times, but every time I listen to it, um, I'm getting something else there. I'm getting all these, you know, and that's just piano. Of course, if you're listening to symphonies or concertos it's it's you know it's much different so even if you're taking classical stuff or or even more modern things uh i think those types of uh albums or things like that are, are really interesting uh, the last point on this is when sometimes sometimes you know kind of when you're listening to something this happened um last last year or two years ago a lot of people wrote a lot of stuff during the pandemic and and there was a couple of albums i listened to where they're like 80 minutes really long uh albums and I knew like track two or three, I was like, wow, I, I'm already feeling overwhelmed. There's so much richness and depth here. I'm going to have to listen to this so many times to just get all of it. And I I like that that doesn't happen often. But when it does happen, for me, it feels like this kind of, uh, it washes over you. And then you just have to have this kind of experience or this kind of you know journey with the music. And I don't know, I think those things are actually quite rewarding and what do you, how do you guys you know think about this yeah I, you what you're describing i mean is the underlying basis for how we as humans you know f explore our world you know and and we we are looking for something novel all the time uh and trying to find that novel thing and that's what excites us right that's that coming back to dopamine and everything else um you there's that great study i think we mentioned in the book um where someone was looking at one of the music streaming sites um, mm -hmm. and realized, was able to figure out how long somebody was listening to a song before they would switch to something else to sample mm. when they were sampling songs. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like the first 10 seconds, if you're not, if you're not hooked by it, you move on to the next piece of uh, next thing on the, uh, on the uh, dinner pl plate, right? It's, it's, it's really something that has to grab you and, and you want to hear more. Um, and then when you do hear more and you and you get into a song that you really really like, you listen to it again. This is neurochemistry at work. Um, uh, so we like things, um, and that's usually involving um, opioid receptors. Interestingly, mm -hmm. um, and so we activate our mu our mu opioid receptors and other opioid receptors in our brain, and that makes us uh, want things. So we go from a liking stage to a wanting bit and when we want that thing and we get it that's that reward system of dopamine and that kind of cycles back to the liking again mm -hmm. um, and you can do that with with music as much as you can do it with chocolate or cocaine mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um the question is at some point most of us uh listen to a song a few times and then we want to move on so those mute open receptors start to go down the dopamine levels start to go down it's like okay now i can move on to the next song or the next whatever it is i, I want to get some pleasure from mm -hmm. um, but when we hear that thing that grabs us, that drives that liking signal, and that then drives us to want more. Mm -hmm. uh, and that could be with a single song or even a group of artists. Um, something else you said was interesting, um, comparing Beethoven's first piano sonata to his 32nd. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's true of the Beatles, too. If you listen to oh, yeah. um, the early Beatles music, mm -hmm. it's really different than what they were doing later. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I think if you weren't somebody who'd heard the Beatles and everything in between, you might not know that they were the same group. Um, the problem is we're, we've been so, you know, overwhelmed by, by Beatles music over the years. We, we probably know they're all the Beatles, but I think if you were to take someone who'd never heard the Beatles before, play something from their very beginnings and then play something from the very end, uh, you, you would say they were different people. And that's again, coming back to this question of, of, curiosity um they were exploring things they were doing things to drive their own creativity mm -hmm. uh and then the listeners of course were curious about what came next too because they they knew this was an artist that they liked mm -hmm. so i think those 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 pathways are so involved in not only creating music but also in how we listen to music mm. dennis what, what do you what do you think about this this idea of you know music as a as a kind of drug if you will or the pleasure you get out of it but this kind of you know first listen and then okay, I don't get all of it. And then again and again and again and again, you know, how, how do you feel about how, how music, I guess, ages and what, what sticks with us and what doesn't more so? And what, what are your thoughts here? 
my most recent thought is this morning on uh, the radio was playing. I was sure it was Beethoven's first symphony. And I remember in a conducting class that I took uh, conducting that the first movement of that symphony. And I thought it, it hit me how simple it was. And Beethoven's my very favorite composer. <laughs> I don't think of him ever as simple. Mm -hmm. And I was astonished, like, because now in relation to our what we're talking about, it's not his ninth. It was his first. Mm -hmm. And it is simple. It compared to the fifth and sixth and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I in terms of practicing and learning uh songs and difficult music it usually takes longer than shorter to appreciate it and find everything that's in it mm -hmm. it's just like reading shakespeare mm -hmm. <laughs> there's always something else there uh my jocular nature has to mention that <laughs> i recently took in airplane uh, uh, and that movie i i've i've seen it twice and this third time, it was like a brand new movie. Mm -hmm. I had didn't realize the depth. Of, it is nonstop, and <laughs> it's it's powerful. So I'm wondering if that in music, listening to music, the more we listen, the more we're going to hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, it, you're, you're tapping on something there, which, which is I, I'm curious what both of you guys think is this role of memory in music, right? Mm -hmm. How, whether you're practicing or performing or composing or listening memory is huge right and yet and yet right one of the things that you know folks that are in uh assistant living homes or people that have memory loss you know whether it's in dementia alzheimer's or what have you there's something that, again it could be the right hemisphere you know kind of very fast acting stores long-term memory quicker than than the left hemisphere and again all of it's connected but um is it's just right there. It puts you right there a lot of the times. Like, you know, you couldn't remember what you had for breakfast, but you're going to know all the song, all the words to, you know, whatever Fr Frank Sinatra song. And it's just like, how is that? What is this role, I guess, of, of, uh, of memory in, for music? So I, it, you're regarding what you're just uh, talking about regarding Alzheimer's or people with de different types of uh, dementia, which is again, going back to my day job. Um, <laughs> so um, it's beyond just, the fact that they can remember lyrics. I mean, there are people who are literally unable to initiate speech uh, because they're so far down the line with their dementia. And yet, when if you play music for them, they can sing along just fine. And in fact, uh, during that singing along period, they become more alert. Mm. Um, it's transient; it doesn't last forever, but but it does it does bring some alertness back and awareness. And there's a couple of different ideas about that, right? So one is the idea that we have this thing called reserve. Um, so if we've been musical throughout our lives, um, we, we do all these things. Uh, I mean, my lab studies, this substance called myelin, for example, um, and myelin helps nerve cells, uh, the impulses travel much faster. I always like to say, if you're, if you have myelin and you're a nerve cell, it's like driving on the Autobahn in Germany at midnight where there's no speed limit. And if you lose your myelin, it's like driving on the worst freeway in the biggest city you can think of at rush hour. We're lucky to be going two miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things we know now is that um, in the course of practicing music um, and learning to play an instrument um, or any kind of fine motor skill like that, where you're combining cognitive, all these other things together to, to do something, um, we actually make more myelin on our nerve cells. We may even make new nerve cells um, through a process called neurogenesis, mm -hmm. um, and we may we know for sure that we're making a lot of making a lot of and strengthening a lot of synapses, the connections between nerve cells. Mm -hmm. So all these things together give you something that may be later in life reserve. Mm -hmm. So if you had this musical experience and the amount of power your brain is is engaging in to in, to be a part of that musical experience, you can imagine that you may lose things like speech or other aspects of your neurological function. But because the brain is so involved in music and so many different parts of the brain, that reserve may allow you to engage in music even when other parts of the brain are damaged. So that to me is is a remarkable possibility. And I think it's part of the basis for why music therapy works. Um, music therapy 
was poo-pooed for a long time by a lot of my colleagues and, and probably by myself when I was in grad school. But, you know, it, uh, you think about Congresswoman uh, Gabrielle Giffords, yeah, yeah. who um, was shot in the head, uh, lost her ability to speak, uh, and a huge part of her therapy was music therapy. Mm. So she couldn't speak, but she could still sing. Mm. Um, and over years of practice in music therapy, that was a big part of what she credits for getting her ability. She, you, know, you, talk, you hear her speak now, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, this is... This plasticity of our brains and our ability to um, form these new circuits and give this reserve is is incredibly powerful, and I think it leads to uh, a lot of big changes that happen in the brain that allow us to engage in music and and continue to perform music no matter how bad things get in the rest of our our neurological function. Mm. Uh, Dennis, what do you think? What are your thoughts about uh, memory and, and music and the, and the and the power it has and the role it has for for music, whether it's you know, performing it, practicing, or or listening? Well, it's it's fascinating that at age fifteen I soloed on the marimba with the San Gabriel Valley Orchestra, and I I can I feel like right this second I can remember everything about that the acoustics the the experience of hearing an orchestra behind my marimba that I, and i i knew the piece it's memorized so just that the part of memory uh my parents were very strict and they would not let me perform in public except memorized everything memorized so my memory was strong then and uh, I I did a solo recital in at age twelve on piano for a half an hour and on marimba for a half an hour, everything memorized. Uh, I think what Larry is just talking about the that part in the brain it must be housed deeply and broadly that causes us to to restore the mu music restores us somehow. There's memory in in music that is beyond other memories. Yeah, it's it's really really interesting, and and, and I I I, uh, I like what both of you guys said, and and again with the the example with uh, Congressman uh, Giffords is a is a is a very powerful one. I, I want to ask this question about <clears throat> it's it's a little more abstract, it's more philosophical, but um, I, I, I'm curious for what your guys' thoughts are here is. Many philosophers um, uh, in the turn of the 20th century, uh, you know, right at the right at the beginning there and, and throughout, had this idea. People can you know debate this, but um, Husserl and Nietzsche and Heidegger and and, and I think uh, Maru Ponty and a lot of phenomenologists thought that truth was was in art, right? We get truth in art, and um, because it's it's a type of um, this aspect where it's untouched. You don't know it until you get it out, until you create it, and then it's and then it's there. And it's not it's not um, uh, entirely um, the well hasn't been poisoned by all these other things necessarily. And so you, they saw this with obviously you know fine art, and they you know I think you could maybe expand that for uh, film and and music and and uh, writing. And so we've talked about all of these things about the aspects of music, um, what it is for us as, as humans, the creativity, curiosity, uh, many components that are involved, how um, restorative it can be. And I'm just curious um, what your guys' thoughts are on this idea that there's a lot of truth in the art we make, um, and uh, obviously that would include music, and, and what, what, what that can do and, and, and what, you guys, uh, what you guys think about that idea. I think all the arts are very significant, but I, I believe for sure that music is maybe its major purpose or the reason that humans are involved in it is because it's socially cohesive. Mm -hmm. We are always somehow pulled together, and if not pulled together, apart, but we're still pulled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Music has a power that's beyond the uh, actual scene part. It's 
spiritual. It's soulful. It, it, it speaks deep. And I think that gets to, you know, the question about how music has been used over the years by people for various purposes. So I think the truth of music, um, I certainly think it does reveal truths about human experience in, in ways that other art forms can also do, but I think sometimes in much more powerful ways. Um, one of the things we talk about um, that I was really surprised by this research is if you get a, a group of people together um, who are in a musical group, and it could be an instrumental group or it could be a choir, for example, mm -hmm. um, and you measure um, certain neurochemistry in those people, um, and there's these endorphins and dopamine uh, come up together uh, when, you, when you're singing in a group. Mm. Um, and the effect of that is feelings of acceptance among the group. Um, it, it really drives that. The, the fact that these endorphins are being fired actually relieve pain. Mm -hmm. um, amazingly, people in choirs report that they actually don't care about their pain when they're singing, mm -hmm. uh, with the, with, but especially with the group, less so when they're alone. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing is when you look at the neurochemistry carefully in terms of the levels of these changes, it's more uh, elevated when you have a bigger group. So if you have a barbershop mm -hmm. quartet, it's going to be a much smaller effect than if you're with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, right? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that, to me, uh, comes back to what Dennis was saying: is the notion that this music does have this? It brings it brings cohesion to human groups. Um, but I think the lyrics in music also are affected by the music itself. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I do in my talk, I usually have a singer with me because I'm not a very good singer. Mm -hmm. um, we do Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. But first, we, when we tell the audience we're going to play Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, but we do it as a ragtime first. <laughs> and it's funny, right? And everyone gets a ha ha ha, but then they listen to it straight right afterwards. And the meaning of the lyrics changes. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that music can do is accentuate or even change the meaning of words mm -hmm. that, and that's something poetry can't do because you don't have that extra musical mm -hmm. aspect of it. Maybe ancient poetry, which was chanted, maybe that's the reason you chanted it, right? Mm -hmm. Because you, you use the chanting plus the lyrics to bring together this powerful message mm -hmm. um, that uh, either the music by itself or the lyrics by themselves wouldn't do. It's, it's, it's synergy. It's not just additive. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. I, I find I find all of this stuff super fascinating, and and I find the preferences. I mean, just you know, my my background as well. I find the preferences of why why ten people can listen to the same thing <laughs> and get different things. It's like, well, don't you hear? It's amazing. I mean, I I, find, I, I, I see I hear all of this. You don't hear all the layers and and mm -hmm. how people listen to music. I can mm -hmm. listen to something, and two people or three people can like it. But they're hearing different things. I'm like, I mean, yeah, sure. But I mean, you're not hearing like, you know, the layering here. And, you know, I'm, I'm when I listen to music, I'm like really like, you know, my mind is going when I listen to music. And not always. Sometimes it, it, it's not that way. But and it's always interesting, the preferences, how people listen to music, how people write different music, how they figure out, you know, when you're writing a piece of music, you could but you could do like these six parts and and you choose this one. And, you know, talking with people that kind of compose, and, you know when is a song finished and what is that like? And it's like, oh, you know, sometimes <laughs> I just gives people just dread of like, I don't know. And I just, it always feels kind of, you know, and sometimes it's like, I know, I just know. And so all these things, and, and sometimes I feel, I don't know, like I'm too, uh, you know, super, um, not critical, but really invested in music. I, I'm really actively listening when I listen to it and thinking about it and stuff. And it's just always interesting to me how, the brain is doing that how different brains do that how different people with personality and experience and and the, it, it kind of culminated all together when i was reading your guys book thinking about all these things and and so the 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 last question i have for both of you is um i, I sometimes ask this but um what um are the one or two things that you want people to kind of walk away from with your book where you can say uh yeah that's what we were trying to get at that's what we were trying to say. You kind of got the idea, or we're, that's that's the kind of thing that you want people to get from you know the the book that uh, that you guys have uh, put out there. 
Dennis, what's your what's your take I, on that? I would want everyone to consider uh, learning a musical instrument or somehow get involved in in music, and that could be through dance, or that could be through singing, mm. and uh, it could even be done in humming, <laughs> which we know <laughs> relaxes the vagus nerves, and. Uh, so I would say in my biggest enjoyment of pro helping produce this book is uh, for brain health, mm -hmm. just the health of the brain. I feel that uh, with my aging brain that when I do difficult practicing, and, uh, I'll say more about that in a second, um, I feel that I'm tweaking my brain in a positive way. I, I feel that when it wants to go downhill just because of it's t t tired or something, I, I can af have an a positive effect on it. So things that I do, I would, um, to make it simple, uh, play one scale with one hand and another scale on the other hand. Mm. Uh, so making my brain hurt and mm -hmm. it takes mm -hmm. total concentration. It's not anything that's uh, it, it, um, automatic. Playing, uh, sight reading any music and sight reading sometimes backwards. Mm -hmm. So reading all, all the notes correctly with the tr uh, proper durations, but it backward because not used to that and i'll notice that oh i i just caught a phrase or a um a pattern and i read it forward because mm -hmm. it, it's hard work to do it backward only mm -hmm. and not notice patterns so uh just clumsy things that uh, aggravate the brain and i feel that's about brain health and and i'm a more more now than five years ago when we started the book <laughs> a believer in this <laughs> yeah that's important yeah uh larry yeah so i think my purpose in starting the talks that i gave um was twofold and i think that purpose carried over into the book uh the first purpose was just to give an example of how science it impacts our daily lives um I, as a, as someone who is a scientist who you know runs a research laboratory here it's, that's trying to find cures for diseases, um, I'm um, I'm always a little taken aback by people who are basically uh, anti science, um, and that troubles me to no end. Um, and so I think that was really one of the underlying goals was to say science, you know, has meaning for our lives, our everyday lives, even when we think about things like music. Mm -hmm. um, and I think on top of that given all the things that we talk about in this book and all the things, all the studies that we've cited and all the things that I've critically read over the last 15, 20 years um, on this topic, you know, I think there's good evidence that we need music and creativity and art in our, in our, in our lives. We need it in our schools. We need it desperately in our uh, education early on, especially. And when I came, I was, I did my postdoctoral training in Germany and came back to this country um, uh, in the mid nineties. And um, it just seemed like every school district was canceling their art and music programs left and right um, to save money. And I think that's a huge disservice. Um, I also think that taking music and art out of our communities is a huge dis disservice to our population. Mm -hmm we need it to enrich our lives and to challenge our brains and um without it it's a pretty empty world mm -hmm. so um and i also think our brain development suffers from it um mm -hmm. and our brain aging as well so i uh, i think my hope that is that this book will drive that message home for everyone mm. yeah yeah no i absolutely agree uh before i let you go one one quick fun question uh you don't have to put too much thought into it but uh I'd be remiss if I didn't ask uh, something like this uh, for each of you. Uh, you don't have to tell me your favorite, but uh, what is someone that's in your your top five? Someone that you just absolutely kind of just think they're amazing. It could be a group, an artist, a composer, past, present. Uh, just who's that one kind of you know group or artist or person or composer that you just always come back to and you're just like, oh, you're like there's just nobody better than this, or you know it could be. 
uh, you know, somebody in your top five. But who's who's that uh, who's that group or artist or composer for for each of you? Miles Davis. <laughs> Is it really? And Miles Davis. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's genius. Oh, the mystery man. I never knew what he was going to do. Yeah. But it was yeah. going to be brilliant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Larry? Yeah, I, I love Miles Davis too, but I have to say, I, I was asked this question for another uh, purpose uh, recently and really thought about it. And I realized uh, one person that keeps coming back to me in my life is Elton John. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And first, because I fell in love with him as a, as a fellow pianist. Um, I just loved the riffs he did. I just loved the chord progressions. I just loved everything about his music, but also just the way he plays. And I've had the honor to sit behind him at a concert and watch him play. And, um, and uh, but also um, the things he's done in his life and he's, how he's persevered with the things he's dealt with. Um, I just, I, if there's any person alive now who I'd like to meet uh, in, in the celebrity category, I think it might be him. I'd love to just hear his his outlook on life and and hear more about um how he got to where he is today and all the things he does and all the charities he's involved with so mm -hmm. yeah uh, that's, that's that's great mm. so the the book is called uh every brain needs music it's through uh columbia university press um where's the best places to find each of you or or any any places uh online or otherwise that you want to uh, point people to uh that's uh, most relevant uh i'm I can probably be reached most easily and, and, and you can catch up on what I'm doing at my university's website, the Oregon Health Sciences University. So mm, nice. Uh, Dennis? And I have a very easy uh, email. I, I love emailing uh, dennisplies at gmail.com. Oh, this is great. <laughs> very easy. Yeah, very easy. Well, uh, gentlemen, uh, it's been an absolute blast to talk about something that I'm extremely passionate about, I'm extremely passionate about music. I also love the brain, and I think your guys' emphasis on brain health and, and keep pushing for arts and humanities um, is, is really, really important. Your book is wonderful, and um, I, uh, I really just uh, can't say enough thanks for, for having both of you here to, to chat with me about it. Thanks. It's been a blast. It's been very pleasurable. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you.